WHLL presents 27 West, featuring the issues and people that impact on the Worcester Metro West area. Now here's your host, Lynn McNamee. Welcome to 27 West. Today we'll be talking about the art of photography and the mystery of photography. And I say mystery because many people get their photos back from the lab and they're stumped. That perfect picture that they thought was the best picture on the roll turns out to be too dark, overexposed, out of focus, people are cut off, and you just can't remember why that happened. The holiday season is fast approaching and many people will be taking more pictures than normal over the next few weeks. So today on 27 West we'll be talking about photography with Peter Faulkner who works at the Worcester Center for Crafts. He is an instructor at the Center for Crafts and also was my instructor for two sessions with Peter and he really helped me a lot so I thought Gee, you can help my viewers too. You're a fabulous photographer. <laughs> oh, thank you very much. Peter, what are some of the most common problems that, that people ask you about? I mentioned blurriness, darkness. Uh, yeah, I don't get too many of those kinds of questions. Mostly the kinds of questions I get from people are, how can I make it better? You know, and, and they'll bring in a stack of work and ask me to, you know, please go through these and tell me about each one. So they have like 300 pictures. <laughs> And, and they're all uh, stick together yeah, and whatever. And, <laughs> you know, I yeah, and there are, uh, there are all, all kinds of problems. And, and what I tell them is that kind of a, a general thing uh, of, of just slow down, take it, take it easy, and, and why don't you sign up for my class and, uh, <laughs> and maybe I can help you uh -huh. uh, a little bit. Well, why, don't, why aren't they pleased with them? Do they, the balance on them isn't right, the lighting might not be right. Yeah, well, by the time they, they make that decision that they're not real excited by them, they, they have a need to come see me or go see someone who can tell them what to do. Um, generally, they're just not happy. It's not dark. It's not what I saw. It's not what, it's, it's not what was there. Why? A lot of people can see, but can't make the camera do what they want it to do. And a lot of times, that's, that's what the problem is. Mm -hmm. They just can't make the machine work. And that is the art of photography. Just because something looks beautiful when you snap the camera does yeah. not mean it will transfer to film yeah, that way. Right, because we have a great Thanksgiving dinner this week. and. Uh, and you feel comfortable and nice and the family's there and you're feeling very happy and you want to photograph mom and dad or the kids or something and uh, that doesn't mean it's going to make a good picture if you've got them in front of a bright uh, sunny window or if you use a flash bulb in front of a mirror or something like that it can wreck the whole picture mm -hmm. so uh, just because you're enjoying the day doesn't mean that the photographs are going to be as as fabulous as you as you feel. You encourage people to see photographically. That means seeing the light and seeing how no, different images are position images are positioned next to each other. How, how do you develop that that sense? Practice, practice. Mm -hmm. Actually, it's it's just changing your your perceptions. Again, what what we've just talked about about people having a nice time, uh, going out with friends and going on a hike up a nice mountain and standing there on this big vista and and seeing this beautiful landscape in front of them and uh, and just putting the camera to their face and it changes everything from this beautiful uh, panoramic view to this small rectangle mm -hmm. it, it, they have no concept of that uh, uh, they have no concept like at the one of the most fabulous places you can see this is at concerts when uh, at the centrum or something where S Springsteen comes on in their favorite song and the flash bulbs start going all over the place and and it's uh, and then you get your pictures yeah, back, and all you have are the shots of the people sitting exactly. in front of you. <laughs> ten, ten feet in front, and then there's Bruce down there about yeah. that big. So they don't have any concept. Uh, I even have old slides of mine of bald eagles that are about that big. Um, apologies to Jack Swedberg out there, but this tiny little uh, eagle. I said, yeah, that's an eagle up there. You can't miss it. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, so you don't have the, the relationship of what the camera can do and can't do and the limitations that you have. And changing the way you see things as to how the the camera is going to pick it up. So what you recommend is people look at when they get a stack of photos back from the lab they should look at them critically and, and really decide well maybe that's too late almost. It's too late? Yeah. Okay. That point. Well no but how, how they can um, teach themselves to start seeing photographically. Um, first they can come to the craft center I was told to say that. <laughs> uh, that would be uh, very helpful for all of us but what they could do is um, just to see if it's what they want and one of the best things ways to, to get better at, at photography is to look at photographs is to go through the magazines that they enjoy uh, uh, look at photographers works that they like and just analyze it look at that rectangle see how it's filled pay attention I think another good tip is don't feel like 
don't feel frantic, like you have to get the shot right now. Yeah. You should really take time and, and wait till the person maybe moves a little bit or wait till the baby lifts their head and, and you'll still get a good yeah. shot. I would like to develop a camera that has like glasses, little ear hooks that people could wear all the time <laughs> and, and practice looking through the camera and understanding that limitation of the, and the relationships like you were saying between the edges and between how, how the head moves and that little angle. It, it's hard to see and say, oh, that's a nice picture, and by the time you get the camera to your head, it's, it's gone. So the idea of having the camera ready and watching and observing is very, very helpful. What are some of the most popular um, images that your students photograph? Um, family and uh, vacations, trips. Uh, initially, after that, they they uh, because I give them assignments every week to to photograph around their house. They begin to photograph their environment, whether it's natural environment or the their house. Do you find that people start seeing images as um, a, a, something as a, they could photograph, whereas before they might not even look yeah, at, looked at it before, like the, a fire hydrant or a, a tree? Yeah, a lot of a lot of times uh, they'll begin to notice light because that's what I, my real thrust is is to understand seeing light and that how light the lights that you have here in the studio create the image. If we turn the lights off, it would be boring television. If, if there dark was television. A dark <laughs> television, maybe not boring, that's true. Uh, uh, but if there's no light on the photograph, uh, it, it just doesn't come across as an interesting image if, if the light isn't quite right. Mm -hmm. If the light is, again, back to the, uh, the centrum, if you're going to see a show and the spotlight was on the audience and you're photographing the, the performer, then you're not going to get anything. And, and those aren't very interesting photographs. Unless you're photographing the audience, then that could be more interesting. Right. We have to go to a break right now. We're talking with Peter Faulkner of the Worcester Center for Crafts. When we return on 27 West, we'll have some examples of Peter's work. Please stay with us. We're talking about photography with Peter Faulkner, who's been an instructor at the Craft Center for how many years? Long time. The 11, I think. 11. 11. You've seen a lot of changes in camera equipment in yes, that, those 11 much. years. Yeah. And I I've seen it in the last two months. It just changes every time Christmas comes around. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Uh, yeah. I want to, we'll talk about that later on in the show. We have a call. Hi, thanks for calling. Where are you from and what's your question for Peter? Yes, uh, thank you. Good morning. My name is Worcester McCarthy. I'm calling from Medfield, Massachusetts. And uh, the question I have for Mr. Peter Faulkner is uh, he, was, he mentioned about the uh, craft center. And I'm a photography copyist and I have a, a highly interest in anything that does with mm -hmm. photography. I was wondering if this is sort of a program that any adult can enroll or is it a type of educational program? Uh, any adult can enroll, and it, hopefully it is educational. Um, we uh, uh, have been in existence for a long time. I've been there uh, 11 years, and, and my predecessor was doing the same kind of work there for like 10 or 12 before me. And what we try to do is, uh, is get you first excited by photography and, uh, uh, and, and show you the ins and outs of the way things work. The Craft Center itself is a is uh, all kinds of different of, of shops, wood shop, metals, and, and so on and so forth, all of very professional caliber instruction. And uh, give it a call. Get, a, get yourself a brochure. And classes are offered morning, afternoon, and evening for photography? Yeah, mostly evenings. Are, uh, my okay. classes are mostly evenings. There is one or two in the mornings. And the dark room is pretty extensive. That's one nice thing about it. You don't have to wait for your own enlarger. You can really jump right in. It's getting uh, full up, so if you are interested in coming to the Craft Center, get there early and sign up because it's a, a, a line, there's a demand, which is nice. Which is nice. I it's, like that, yeah. It's all because of you. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> you brought along some examples of your work, Peter. Yes. And the first, the first set of, of slides we will look at today have to do with nature photography. And huh? Why don't you just start explaining what, what we're seeing? Okay, this first image is, uh, uh, I, I, I use a view camera. And a view camera is uh, like those big box cameras with the bellows that you see. And this is a, a, a photograph I made in Ireland of a river called the Bonoan River. And the exposure was approximately 15 minutes long. Hmm. So the water became very soft. This image here is also done in Ireland. It's, uh, I call it my tree. I was there with a group of Clark University students and we saw this tree uh, as we drove by. The sun was breaking behind this lake. Very few trees in Ireland, so they're very much separated from one another. And I just trashed across the countryside to make this image. Uh, this image was made in a field trip with a group of students from the Craft Center. Uh, each spring we try to do something. Uh, we went up to uh, the Parker River Wildlife Refuge at Newburyport out on Plum Island. And this is a, a multiple image, uh, two shots on the same negative of blowing, blowing weeds. And uh, mm -hmm. hopefully it feels kind of like a pen and ink type drawing. 
Now, I noticed you call it image, and, and most people call them pictures. Did I do that? What's the difference between pictures and images? Uh, professionalism, I'm sure. Okay. I don't know. Uh, um, it is an image that's made on, I kind of think what I'm doing is sculpting with light. I'm, I'm etching a, a light sensitive surface made of silver emulsion uh, with light and it's, uh, so it's, and it's creating an image. I'm not, I was told when I first started that, that I am not taking a picture, I'm making an image or making a picture. So I have to actually mm -hmm. make it. What's, so, speaking of differences, with them, what's the difference between a snapshot and a photograph? Uh, perception, I think. Okay. Uh, and that uh, what you might perceive as an interesting photograph may not speak any more broadly than to you or to your family, whereas uh, a non-snapshot perhaps could speak to the general public and to anyone, where uh, I could be excited by looking at this image and it wouldn't matter if it was your mother or father or child or your house, that it was just a very exciting photograph. So it would have a broader appeal, I not just think. to your grandmother and yeah. your co-workers. Yeah. I think that that probably is, is the way I would define mm -hmm. it. That certainly isn't the definition, mm -hmm. but... Now, when I was in college, they always said, don't take pictures of babies or pets. However... Unless you're trying to sell them. And puppies and sunsets and pets, you know, children. People love those. Do they sell well? Uh, not for a lot of money, oh, okay. but, uh, but they do sell. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, I, I, I think what they're trying to do is challenge your vision by saying, don't do that. Uh, the way I learned it was, uh, if you can't make it good, make it orange. <laughs> meaning like sunsets. Like sunsets. And, yeah. Put your dog in front of the that's sunset. That's right, that's right. <laughs> There's a lot of, of ways of looking you at You mentioned, that. Peter, that you use a, a pinhole camera. And yeah. in your next group of slides, you use that extensively. Why don't you explain now what a pinhole camera is and well, how it works? Well, a pinhole camera is, is the, the simplest kind of camera. We used to make it with children uh, with a Quaker Oats box. First you make the cookies from the oats. That's the best part. <laughs> then you have to have this empty box and then you spray it black and put a, a opening with a pinhole usually in some sort of metal like tin foil. And, uh, and you expose using photographic paper as film mm -hmm. by just pulling a piece of tape off or some other way of, of controlling the amount of light. And it makes a very soft edged image with a very long exposure and with the Quaker Oats a very rounded kind of wide angle distorted image. So it's fun for children. And I just took that concept a little further and decided I would do it with film. And I made my view camera, which is the big box with the bellows, uh, and I adapted that to a pinhole and have just dragged it out into the streets of Worcester and, and the <laughs> And country. we'll see some example, the examples of pinhole photography when we return on 27 West. Please stay with us. We're talking about photography, helping you get ready for the upcoming holiday season where you're sure, you're sure to be taking a lot of pictures. Peter Faulkner is an instructor at the Worcester Center for Crafts, and he not only uses your basic Minolta Canon or whatever Nikon camera that you buy at the store, he's also crafted his own camera called a pinhole camera. And you've really created some exciting images, Peter, that... Um, Gee, thanks. For example, well, let's, let's just show, show these okay. images right now. You, you, you visited downtown Worcester. And you were able to, um, well, here we go. Okay. Uh, th oh, these aren't pinholes. This is, a little, oh, okay. this is a little earlier project just before that. This I call Pieces of Worcester, where I used one roll of 35 millimeter film to change the way I saw the city. I call this uh, Worcester, uh, World Trade Center Worcester, <laughs> where I've uh, made the Shawmut Bank Tower. This is our old standby uh, Union Station, where I photographed it using two rolls of film and merely cut the film up and placed them on the on the photographic That's paper. That's certainly a different image of Union Station. Well, it's the way I see it falling down and crumbling, kind of a waste of beautiful architecture. I um, feel mm -hmm. sad about that. Mm -hmm. Now, here's, uh, the, now here's the pinhole, yeah. And uh, notice the other thing is, is the quality of the light is very strong here. And that I used, a, besides the pinhole, I used infrared film, which is sensitive to, uh, infrared film is sensitive to infrared light, which is a little longer wavelength. And as a result, you get kind of a, an ethereal glowing quality to the image. And that reinforces the pinhole, the softness of the pinhole. Here, Edgemere Drive-In, uh, when I, it appeared as if it was on its last legs, uh, going the way of most drive-ins uh, in Shrewsbury. Um, the pinhole makes it kind of a, a desolated look, I think. Now, why do the trees become so bright and glowing? No, that's the infrared film. Uh, it records, that again, that longer wavelength of light and anything that is that's alive and reflecting a lot of of heat on and light. That, that, that photo we saw of the Mechanics Tower in downtown Worcester, what was the exposure time on that photo? Mechanics Tower. Oh, that wasn't Mechanics Tower. That was the uh, Shawmut oh, Bank. Oh, it wasn't? The Shawmut Bank. Oh, the, oh, the other one. Okay, the, the pinhole. Mechanics Tower. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. <laughs> the get, get windows to know fell the city. out of it last get, week. <laughs> uh, that exposure was about uh, 20 seconds. 
mm -hmm. or I just pull a piece of tape off the pinhole, count to 20, and close it. And it's a very strange look. If you notice, uh, if you ever take, have a chance to see the original print, there's no people there. There's no cars. Everything, because of the long exposures, the people have passed in front and have just disappeared. It's almost desolate. It's strange. Mm -hmm. You've launched an exciting project, Peter, that people are probably saying to you, why are you doing this? You asked me that. <laughs> You're photographing I-290, which yeah. has been called the lifeline of Worcester. It runs right through the city of Worcester. And, uh, and you're cutting a number of neighborhoods in exactly. two. Exactly. Uh, you said you grew up in a neighborhood that was cut uh, by, this, by the highway. It just, that intrigued me. The uh, fact that I live in Grafton and come into the city um, every day. Oh, we don't have any okay. images yet. Uh, I come under the highway or get on the highway. I've used it constantly. And um, it's just made an impact on me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I kind of like going under some of the, the darker um, tunnels and, and uh, the absence of light. And the, uh, the show that I'm putting together is using this pinhole process again and this infrared film. And some of the darker areas are turned absolutely black, almost like the absence of light okay. and cold and dark. And, why don't we run that so we can see right. what you're talking about? And again, you are using the pinhole camera pinhole on, on I-290. Yeah, an infrared film. Uh, this is a, a statue of Columbus in, in uh, um, Washington Square looking to down Shrewsbury Street toward the highway. I call it watching traffic or watching the traffic, something like that. I forget. Um, beautiful, bright, sunny day helps with this kind of film. And this is uh, from Shrewsbury looking toward uh, Worcester, toward the... Uh, uh, Quinn Sigmund Bridge, um, and uh, the the show it's going to be at the uh, Craft Center, uh, the Worcester Center for Crafts now, um, in September of 1990, and it's going to cover the highway from um, Hope Ave to uh, Lake Quinn Sigmund. And now this is my honey here. This is my wife. Uh, photograph I made on another field trip with the. Okay, she's not standing the, on 290. No, <laughs> this is not. If it was, we're in trouble. No, this is this is just one I put because we have a show at the Grove Street Galleries. We, as a group of my students, called the Sunday Photography Group, and I am including photographs, ten images of my wife that I've made, uh, doing an extended portrait. Um, so from. How does she feel about that? that, that uh, surprisingly, she feels very well, very good about it. I was I was surprised when I first asked. She says no, and her. Don't tell her there's a couple of nudes in it even, and, and uh -oh. uh, she's very okay, and she's very good about that. That'll be exciting to see, and that's yeah. at the Grove Street Gallery. Grove, yes. The 290 ex ex exhibit and will be at the Worcester Center for Crafts. In September, okay. whole, almost a year away. Thank goodness, I have a lot of work to do. We have to take another break. Okay. We're talking with Peter Faulkner of the Worcester Center for Crafts. Please stay with us. The 27 West. Peter, you've said there's a, a large demand for your classes. A waiting list can um, accumulate. I know. I once tried to get into one of your classes and had to wait uh, uh, for a little while. Why is that? Is, is, is photography becoming popular or trendy again, or is there just a hardcore group of people who are almost addicts and, and continue to enroll in your classes? There are some addicts, as you call mm -hmm. them. Yeah, there are a group of people who are uh, still continuing to, to produce new and exciting work. I hope new and exciting. If they're watching, they'll know I expect that. Um, yeah, there, there is a group of people who are staying on and working hard, and, and I encourage them to, to continue to work. But there's also a, a large list of new photographers coming in who uh, perhaps want a, uh, an additional amount of control in their work and, and want to be able to express themselves better. With these new students, are you seeing an increase in the use of this, this, these fancy electronic cameras that uh, you used to call airplane jets? Yeah, they look <laughs> like jets, yeah, because there's no controls on them anymore. They're all just these little things. I guess it's almost like you can wish it to change. Uh -huh. um, I'm seeing more of them. Uh, there's quite, a, as I mentioned to you earlier, quite a number that are, are coming out of mom and dad's old closet, the old Minoltas and the Canons, and, and there are some new uh, fancy Nikons mm -hmm. that are uh, coming. In as, uh, there, there's all, a whole range of things that I get to see. But as you, as you have shown with your pinhole camera, a fancy camera is not necessary. No, it's not. It's, it's the guy, the person, the individual behind the camera. And not the, you can make beautiful images. I have a, a student who's using the Quaker Oats box, having a wonderful time. Uh, one of my teenage students, and he's really, really enjoying it. And so you don't need a, mm -hmm. a fancy camera with a telephoto lens. The bigger the lens, not the better the picture. But you do need some basics. Would you recommend tripods for people? Yeah, tripods, uh, paying attention. I made a whole list here before we came but uh, 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 of different things. But yeah, a tripod would be very helpful. A lot of people feel it's like bringing Bambi with them, so you know, with all legs and, <laughs> and, and so on, and that's a little hard to deal with. So I usually don't push it until later on if they've become serious about it. Mm 
Um, but just learning to hold still and holding the camera steady and, and relaxing. That's mainly the thing and paying attention to what they're doing. The Worcester Center for Crafts is located right off Park Avenue in yep. the city of Worcester. And you are having a, a sale coming up this big, weekend. Uh, big, fabulous uh, craft fair. Uh, we have two a year. This one is, uh, is the uh, Thanksgiving one, of course, and, and, uh, for the holidays. And represented, uh, it's a juried craft show. Uh, very well-respected uh, craftspeople are there selling their wares. So come on down, everyone. And, and see the fabulous work, even to come and enjoy the entertainment that we'll, that we'll have food. The, the summer craft fair is outside. Will this be outside? I hope not. I I'm know. pretty <laughs> sure this one is inside. Uh, so I, it's not as large as the Yeah, it's a one. smaller group, yeah. In, in the get, big gallery, I believe, most of it is, is held in there. Well, Peter, we've run out of time. Oh, Thank you very quick. much. Will you be photographing this holiday, or do you just do oh, no, I, your work I, outside? No, I gave an assignment, uh, and I would like to do that as well, to photograph people's family as they come over for the holidays. And I even showed them how to set up a nice little studio in their corner of the house that they won't be using. Good. We'll see how they do. I'll let you know. Okay, we'll have to have yeah. you back. Good. Thanks for being my guest. Okay. Tomorrow on 27 West, we'll have the director and an actor from the new play at the Forum Theater, as Shana Madel as my guest. Please stay with us. WHLL new date a fun farm in Boston. But uh, this seems to me to be a, a, a very strange issue. People will say, oh, it's quite right to do, to do the exhibition, uh, but not with uh, taxpayer pays money. Um, now, why should it be right to do it with private funds, not right to do it with taxpayers' funds? We as taxpayers agree to a whole range of programs which our government does, some of which you approve of, some of which we approve of, but we sure, sure don't approve of the total, total range. Now, it seems to me that what we want is we want uh, the state, we want uh, the fair, fair federal government to ensure that we have a lively cultural and artistic scene and one which is subsidized and supported, which means then that everybody can, take, uh, can, can make use of it. And if we didn't have government funds, it was all privately funded, then all government, then all programs in the arts, whether it was in museums or theaters or music, would be incredibly expensive and only the rich could afford to enjoy the arts. I believe that art has been served and American culture has been served by this controversy. Because one of the things that we think of in the arts, we think of them as belonging to the entertainment side of life, the spectacle, which people, bread, the bread and circuses part of life. The real point about the arts is that they offer a challenge to life itself. They offer, as Matthew Arnold said in the 19th century, a criticism of life. And Maplethorpe offers a criticism of life, a challenge to conventional values. And that's why it's had such a divisive and con controversial effect. Joining me now is Marianne Pressamarita of the Connecticut Citizens for Decency organization and Brian Johnson of Real Artways. It's a community art organization that presents new and unusual art. Thank you both for being with us. Um, let's start off with you, Marianne, because you and your group picketed the Wadsworth last Saturday at the opening of uh, Maplethorpe's The Perfect Moment. You really feel strongly that this, some of his work should not be in that museum. Definitely. And Definitely. why? What is the why? Because it is out and out pornography. It's what we've been fighting for 12 years in the Connecticut. The uh, pornography that we find in adult bookstores and that's exactly what we saw in the portfolio of uh, XYZ, if that's what they call it. And uh, it was very, very offensive. It was, I would say, according to the standards of the state, on, on judging obscenity, it passes. And although there is a warning, there's an indication that if your child is seven, that 17 years um, and under will not be allowed, that, you know, these are, they, or they will not be allowed without their parents. And I understand that there were parents there with their young children showing it. You yes, and if, if, if in fact it is against the state stature, those parents are breaking the law by showing their children something that is legally obscene. It is wrong. I mean, what kind of decent parent would want to show her child penises, erections, a pipe in the rectum, fists in the rectum, a little girl with her dress up nude with uh, no underwear? I mean, what 
try what parent in their right mind would want to show their child that they already know what their body looks like why do they have to see something like that in a respectable place like the Athenaeum right but and that's where you come in you think that Mary is wrong I think that Mary is a little bit extreme in some of her views and some of the some of the ideas that 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 uh, that she's presenting I think that no one, uh, America is still a free country. No one has to go in there who does not wish to go in there. Uh, just like any pornography store, you don't have to go in if you don't it's wish to go in. It's still their environment, and that's what we're fighting. This is public morality. If you believe in the privacy of your home, it would be your business. But this is in the public. The public belongs to all of us. And if we are breaking the law and bringing in something like this, it, in, in, it uh, affects everyone in the community. If you bring in an adult bookstore into a community, the whole quality of life goes down. We've seen that happen in East Hartford, so we know what we're talking about. And bringing this into an, the Athenaeum, a place like the Athenaeum, and saying, you know, this is our, it's an insult to the people of Connecticut to call wow. some of those pictures art. It's out and out filth. Is it, explain to me why is, why is that art, Brian? What, how, do, how would you do? Find that it, you as know, art. art, I think, is the documentation of human experience. And in many cases, some of our experiences go a little further for some of us than for other people. And uh, Mapplethorpe, I think, was not, uh, was, not, was not photographing something that came out of his mind. He was not, he was not posturing anyone. He was documenting the, you know, I suppose it's a sort of, from my point of view also, a little bit extreme extreme uh, interpersonal activity of living human beings. And uh, I, art, is, art is, as I said, the documentation of human activity in all its different forms. There are... Uh, Some of it is pornographic. Well, I suppose it depends <laughs> on what your, your, your idea of pornography is and things that are obscene. What is it? Some of it pornographic in your mind as, a, as an artist? I think some of the things were a little bit obscene, but I didn't think of them certainly as, as, as uh, pornographic. I mean, I've seen all sorts of things that are extreme. I mean, that's part of the things that we do at Real Art, which is try to, try to stretch a little bit the boundaries of your perception. So the next time you see something of that, of that type, you think, well, maybe that's not so bad compared to, you know, the, the destitute people living on the street so, for which yeah. no so from the audience, they've, they've abused that they've abused the word to, to mean even the homeless well we know obscenity refers to sexual material so, and this is what we're talking about this is sexual material this is sadomasochism material this is sick material Maplethorpe himself was obsessed with the penis he was a sick man he died by what he was obsessed by let me ask, let me ask you, how do you explain this to your children? How, how does, from the artist's point of view, how, how would you how explain, explain it? Would you, take, would, well, would you take a child, to, so should young children do that? No, that's, oh. that, that's what goes without saying. And I was, I've been at the exhibit and I didn't see any young children. I saw children who have a, a, an awareness of the parts of their body, certainly. And if anything, it educates them to the types of things, maybe not what not to do in their lives, you know? And, it, and, and nobody's telling them that, is there? Is there anyone but saying, no don't do this, this, this is this sick? No the one yes, I, see, I saw little children in their mother's arms, and those are sick parents that bring their little children to see something like that. You mean a little infant on no, my I saw somebody little, in there, an infant on you know, somebody's shoulder. That back. little child wouldn't sleeping, understand, you know. but someone who could talk. Uh, How do you think my grandson said to me when, he op when I opened up the Hartford Current Sunday, Grandma, are those two people brothers that were kissing and hugging? That is the type of person among some of the highly educated that are being drawn to that exhibit. Many homosexuals are being, that's a sick lifestyle. Those who practice that are sick. It is a sick, it goes against nature, it goes against God, you know, it goes a against know, anything that's good, and it also is spreading society, AIDS, which is killing everyone who practices this. I think one of the most dearest commodity is love and tenderness between love. human people. That's not and love. Pornography is never love. It debases women and children. I'm so don't about call. The relationship between people who choose that's not to love. That's sick. That's sick. You can have sex without love, and you can have love well, without see, sex. Uh, you know, we what have. What can a, I say? But that's your point of view. Well, you're calling it love, and I'm telling you, I have a loving relationship with a very dear friend of mine. That's a girl. We don't have sex, but it's still a loving relationship. So, 
This is ridiculous to call well, aren't anything. Aren't people that hugging? Is, I mean, necessarily they weren't only hugging; love, they were you know? kissing. I hugged my mother. That doesn't that mean I'm sick. Sick. Absolutely. Absolutely. But, in, but okay, <laughs> let's, let's try to define homosexuality. And, and, but uh, this is but what let's, get, let's, let's try. Let's try to get back to this. And you said I've got the sense from you that it is not. It is not something that young children should experience without well oh. any any kind of thing takes judgment i mean you wouldn't pull young children through an alley filled with drunken bums either because there's some sort of negative experience that they could have i mean i we wouldn't take it bring... loosely though can we handle it that loosely or do we have to say well you know let's let's think there about there's definitely it. right and wrong we and we have well, to say this is right and this is wrong drunken bums i think you understand that analogy there where there's a potential for some sort of danger, some sort of either physical or emotional danger, I mean, it goes without saying that you wouldn't bring small children or you wouldn't want to expose them to that sort of thing. And how much... Uh, uh, even I, even I uh, you're a minor until you're 18. Does that mean your mind does not become polluted after 18? <laughs> Watching and seeing that a man in a polyester suit with his penis hanging out of his pants, what do they... How can they dare... To I insult the people. Well, myself, it's you know. humor too is sick. I mean, to okay. call that yes. art. Yes. 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 So what are you? What is your group going to do about this? Are you? We'd so like upset to about see it? that the obscene material is removed. I, I mean, take a lot of support. I, I'm not personally. Maybe the state could do this. We're going to try and see if something can be done because this is breaking the law. This, this is wrong. This is wrong, and to call pornography art is, is sick on the part of the people who are responsible for bringing this garbage to our Athenaeum. All right, uh, let's go to, should governments find an art that offends some people? We'll have that debate in a few seconds. And we'll come back and talk to you. is State Representative Eugene Migliaro. He is a Republican from Wilkett. And House Speaker at Large, Representative Irving Stolberg, a Democrat from New Haven. Gentlemen, thank you both for being with us. Hi, Jim. Uh, Representative Migliaro, you have said, based on the pictures you've seen of uh, Maple Thorpe's perfect moment, that it should not be art that the state funds. You want the state to, in essence, to fund to watch with Athenaeum. Absolutely. I, I don't believe that any type of trash, such as this, and that's what I dub it. I won't show it on your screen. But we say the ticket is art. And uh, I don't believe it's art. I believe it's, it's uh, suggestive. And I think it exposes to a lot of people to the fact that, uh, that this is our way of life. I mean, you've got youngsters in there exposing their privates. You've got uh, grown-ups well, standing, standing there with their privates showing. Uh, when I was a police officer, we used to arrest them for indecent exposure. But they changed it from indecent exposure and call it art, this Robert Maplethorne, whatever he is. I think it's wrong. And I think that if this type of display is going to be continued, everybody that wants to go see it, it's their constitutional right, let them do it. But I don't think the state should fund it, because I think there are many people, once they view the type of things that they depict it as art, uh, would be very offensive to them. And I don't think they'd want their tax dollars to be spent for that type of a display. Uh, Representative Stover, can I bring you in here? You have an opposite position in there. I think the Athenaeum is one of the premier uh, galleries and museums in America. I'm very proud that Connecticut uh, provides some funding for the Athenaeum. Uh, I think some of Maplethorpe's uh, items are exquisite, uh, and I think others are, are not to my taste. Uh, I don't know how Eugene is going to set up the jury that's going to judge what is good and what is bad, what is art and what is not. Uh, I think uh, as long as the Athenaeum, and, and I understand it has, uh, has an alert coming in that some of the items in there might be effective, uh, I would uh, not support defunding the Athenaeum. I think that's uh, a, an inexcusable proposal. How would you decide? How would you decide what is or what is in art? Well, I believe from the book that you have here before us with the pictures and the types of ex exhibitions that they have, I think the committee was set up, made up of John Q. Citizen as well as some of the political uh, authority that uh, funds the program, I think they can decipher what should be uh, afforded and what should not be afforded and for what purpose. I'm sure that most of the stuff that's in this book, not most of it, but uh, a lot of it is, is good quality. But the parts that the, the pick at the human anatomy, I think, is wrong. And when you, you're showing gays kissing and making love and you're showing youngsters, I think that uh, 
uh, art is supposed to depict what type of culture we stand for, what we are. That is not an accepted social norm in our, in our system today. And I think you're giving people the impression that that is an accepted social norm. Uh, Jim, I, I think uh, Eugene has some problems understanding the fundamental nature of democracy. Uh, it's not only the norms, it's to protect minorities and protect all ranges of minorities in their opinion and expression. Uh, and as long as, as I have anything to say about it, uh, the minorities in this nation will be protected. I think that's the fundamental difference between this society and dictatorial society. Uh, I don't care for some of the Maplethorpe items, but if some individuals that do and choose to look at them, I think they should have the opportunity. There are some people who apparently appreciate this, who see it as art. I mean, 300 of these books were sold out. Well, there's no question there's a lot of sickles in this world. There's no question about it that they would appreciate that type of tripe. I don't question that. My answer to that is very simple. And as far as me knowing the difference with democracy, I served the United States Marine Corps in 1942. I think I know what democracy is. Uh, but for Mr. Stolberg here to say that, and by his own admission, there is stuff in there that is not acceptable. No, I, I, I said, believe I that. Said, if, Eugene, I didn't say there's stuff that's not.